part three of the sermon from two weeks ago. I should have just gone ahead and broken it down into three from the beginning, but here we are. Turn with me, if you will, to the book or letter, the epistle of Philippians, chapter two. <clears throat> We will finish the rest of verse 7 and 8 this morning. The last two weeks, we have looked at the example of Christ. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, seven points from verses 6 through 8 on who Christ is. We looked at the person of Christ, first of all, His divinity and, and His humanity. And we looked at the humiliation last week and emptying of Christ. And this week, today, we'll look at the last three points. The incarnation of Christ, the obedient, uh, obedience or obedient life of Christ, and the death of Christ. If you will stand with me this morning for the reading of God's Word, if you are able. I'll be, begin reading in verse 5 through 8. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Father, this morning, show us by Christ's being and doing what you have called us to by example in Christ. Teach us about what it means that Christ lived obediently died obediently. Lord, show us from your word. Exalt the name of Christ through your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As I mentioned a couple weeks ago, our, the main idea or purpose here in this section in verses 6 or 5, 6 through 8 uh, is that if we are going to be united and humble in Christ, as we looked at in verses 1 through 4, we must know the Jesus who is the ultimate example of humility. We must know the real Jesus. And that's what we have been looking at the last couple weeks in this example of Christ. And what we will continue to look at in verses 9 through 11 as we look at the exaltation of Christ. All of these are connected, but we just happen to break them down in this, this way. We must know who this real Jesus is in order to know why we must humble ourselves. What, what true humility really looks like. As in, uh, We must look at Christ as our example. So as I mentioned, this morning we'll look at three last pieces and there... I'm just going to say it up front. There's so much in here that I could not say. And it would take a lifetime, and it will take a lifetime, to expand on all that Christ is to and for us. So, in my weak and feeble way, I will try to uh, teach you this morning from, from this, again, verse and a half on just who Christ is here. So we'll start with the incarnation. Incarnation of Christ. That is the end of verse 7, beginning of verse 8. It says, <clears throat> Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. Now, we talked about Christ's full humanity in that first week, a couple weeks ago. So I won't rehash a bunch of that. Uh, he was 100% man. We can be fully convinced about that. But we're going to expand on that just a little bit more uh, 
to really drive home the point that is being made here. Being born in the likeness of man, the, the incarnation of Christ. You've not, have you heard that word before? Okay, good. So it's not new. Incarnation simply means to, to, to put on meat, to put on flesh. God the Spirit, the eternal... <clears throat> Uh, God who is Spirit, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Son of God, full deity, put on flesh, incarnated. Put meat on spirit. <laughs> okay? <clears throat> so this is very much a Christmas passage, and it's July. <laughs> and that's okay. Uh, because the incarnation of Christ is something that we must not just think about on Christmas. In fact, the fact that we even celebrate Christmas the way that we do does a disservice to this doctrine. We only think about Christ putting on flesh at Christmas time, then we miss out on what that means for us today, in July 31st. So let's not make... The birth of Jesus, the, the coming of Jesus into this world, just a Christmas thing. It can't be. It can't be. This is a vital doctrine for us to understand for our day-to-day -day life. He's using it in a context here that we're seeing over and over again about our daily humility towards one another. Our unity with one another. Therefore, we cannot rele relegate this doctrine to a a day or even a month of the year. Uh, and I'm not saying anybody here does that. I'm just saying the, the nature of putting Christmas time in a certain day and a certain place and celebrating the birth of Jesus and the coming of Christ on that just unfortunately creates that mindset that that's a Christmas time thing. But it's so important for us even today. So the incarnation of Christ. Jesus 100% man. The Spirit, the God who is Spirit, put on flesh. And He had to do that, I mentioned, because He had to be like us. It was necessary for our salvation. This is where we're going to bring this, that topic I talked about two weeks ago up today. He did this to represent us in His very being. Now, in a little bit, we're going to talk about representing us in His doing. But it's important that He came in the flesh to be man. Before He ever does anything, He has to be man. It's a larger passage, but I think it's helpful for us in, 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 in grasping this concept. Hebrews chapter 10, <clears throat> verses 1 through 10. The author of Hebrews says this, For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Now, stop there for a second. The Jewish biblical idea of sacrifice is that a sacrifice of a bull or a goat or some other sacrifice must be made in order to make uh, a payment for sin, right? This is a basic concept brought up uh, as we see through the Old Testament. That was a shadow of things to come. It was a shadow of what Christ had to do. There needed to be a sacrifice made. There must be a blood payment for sin. That's how God created us. That's what God established in the Old Testament. So that's what we're talking about here in Hebrews chapter 10, okay? <clears throat> so that sacrifice can never, by the same sacrifices, those bulls and goats that are continually offered every year to try to make atonement for sin, can never make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible 
for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Why? Because they're bulls and goats. And you and I are not animals. It doesn't represent us. That blood is different. It's not the same blood. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Consequently then, when Christ came into the world, He said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for Me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, you have neither desire, de desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Bulls and goats cannot represent us. Only a man, full human, can do that. That's what Jesus did. He took on flesh in order to do that. Now, I think that part has been clear. But there's more to the incarnation. There's more to the humanity of Christ for us. Now, salvation, we'll get, we'll get more to that in just a minute. Very important. But His humanity also made Him a man so that He could sympathize with our weaknesses. Hebrews also tells us in chapter 4, verses 4 through 15, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus came to be a man because that's what he needed to be in order to provide the ultimate sacrifice. But he also did it so he could sympathize with our weakness. Infinite God put on frail and finite flesh so that he could sympathize with our weakness. Sympathize with our trials. Sympathize with our temptations. Sympathize with the things that we go through day in and day out. But Mark, you don't know what I've been through. I know somewhat. But I don't know everything. But Jesus does. <laughs> Jesus does. The God-man there is a man on this earth who knows your weaknesses. Every single one of them. He knows my weaknesses. He, he is acquainted with weakness. He has been through temptation. He has been through trials. Our Savior knows what it means to be human. He knows suffering. He is acquainted with grief, sorrow, pain. He was despised and rejected. He was betrayed by a friend. He was left to die alone by his disciples. He was hungry. He was tired. He was tested. Jesus knows. And he can sympathize with our weakness. You see, the, those verses there in Hebrews 4, 14 through 15, don't end there. Read verse 16. So he was like us in every respect, tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We're not going to a God who does not know our weakness. We're not going to a God for grace in, t in our time of need who does not understand the need. 
Jesus knows. He can sympathize with you. We can come to Him because He was fully man, because He lived a life just like we did. We can go to Him for compassion and mercy and grace that we need every single day. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter what you've gone through. It doesn't matter what you will go through. Jesus can sympathize with your weakness. Go to Him. <laughs> Go to Him. Draw near to the throne of grace with confidence. And you will find the mercy and grace to help in time of need. Because our Jesus came to do that. <sighs> Point number six. <laughs> These last two, six and seven. The obedience of Christ and the death of Christ, or the life of Christ and the death of Christ. Together, put, put together, represent a, um, a theological concept called penal substitutionary atonement. Now, you probably know the word atonement, you probably know substitution. We'll put together uh, this atonement, uh, as Wayne Grudem put it, the atonement is the work of Christ, or the work Christ did in his life and death to earn our salvation. The atonement is the work Christ did in His life and death to earn our salvation. Oftentimes we think of death, we, 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 we think of the death of Christ as the atonement for our sins, but, but oftentimes we leave out the life part. And his life was just as necessary for our salvation as his death was. And let me explain why. This is not me coming up with ideas here. <laughs> so, again, <clears throat> as we think about these next two things, we must remember his being. Jesus is fully God, fully man. His being, being 100% God and man, is necessary He had to be God and man for both of the next two points, for his obedience and his death. In other words, Jesus had to be in order to do. Okay? He had to be fully God, fully man, in order to do what he was going to do, in order to be our atonement. So this we can extrapolate a basic life principle here. What and we, we've mentioned this previously, what and who we are determines how we live. What we believe, uh, what we are, uh, determines how we live. So in order for him to do what he did, he had to be what he was and is, by the way. 100% God. He had to be 100% God for perfect righteousness. And he had to be 100% man to be our perfect representation in order to glorify God, that is, to love Him perfectly in our place, and to appease God's wrath, which was deserved by sin, so that God's justice may be satisfied, thereby earning salvation for us. He had to be in order to do these things. Um, before we move into this, um, it's important to realize that God, in His perfect justice, did not have to save anyone. That's right. Not one of us. God would have been perfectly just to send every single one of us to hell. And if we don't come to that realization, we're going to be uh, more prideful than we ought. God does not have to save anyone. He could have allowed us to be like the angels when they fell. He says in 1st, 2nd Peter chapter 2, verse 4, casting them into hell, committing them to the pits to be kept until the final judgment. He did not have to save anyone at all. He would have been perfectly and completely just to do so. But God, 
decided to save people from their sins. He decided out of his grace and mercy to, to gather the sheep from among the goats. To save those, as Ephesians 1 tells us, that he had predestined to adoption as sons. And so then, as a consequence of God's sovereign choice to save, he made a way. Because he has chosen to save, therefore he made atonement for sin. And that is what we're looking at here. That way to be saved is this penal substitutionary atonement of Christ's perfect life and perfect death. So, number six, the obedience of Christ. Look at verse eight. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. We already looked at his humility, but he humbled himself. He, let's, let's recap here. He took on flesh. He became a servant. He, he emptied himself. He became man. He humbled himself out of obedience to God the Father's will. He chose to save, therefore, Jesus, out of obedience to God's will to save, came, took on flesh, did what God had willed. And in humbling himself, here, here's where we're getting to, he became obedient. It says became obedient, but let's not get twisted and, and, and think that somehow Jesus went from disobedient to obedient, not that he became obedient over time, or that he, there was a time when he wasn't and then he became it. Becoming obedient doesn't mean he wasn't obedient before, but in a new way, now in the flesh, as a man. He was already obedient. There was, there was already that perfect loving relationship of authority and submission within the Trinity. Son submitting to the Father. There, there was never a time he wasn't, but now in a new way he took on flesh. He had to be obedient in the flesh. Again, as a representative for us. In a new way. And now this doctrine is usually called Christ's active obedience. Or perfect obedience. His, his life of living obediently to God. To obey God's law perfectly in his entire life. Obedient to the point of death. Now it's talking about in his, his death as well, but up all the way to the point of death. There was, it wasn't that all of a sudden at the point of death, Jesus then became sinless and he was obedient in that. No, he was obedient from the very beginning all the way to the point of death. There was no sin in his life. He was actively obedient. He, he, he was sinlessly perfect. And Jesus had to live a perfectly obedient life in order to, once again, represent us. If Jesus was not perfect, sinless, he was not perfectly obedient to God's word, then he himself would have the guilt of sin on himself. And he would have had to die for his own sins. Romans chapter 3, the wages of sin is death. Jesus glorified God in every respect. He did not fail in any way, for any moment whatsoever. From his incarnated birth to his death, he lived a sinless, obedient life to the glory of God. And he had to do that. He had to live obediently in order to earn righteousness on our behalf. When God saves us or redeems us by His Spirit, through the Gospel, by grace, through faith, He does not just clear our guilt away. He does. 
He paid a debt we, did, we, we, we could not pay, right? I mean, he, he paid the penalty for our sins. And, and his sins, his blood covers us and cleanses us so that we are white as snow, right? The, he does clean away sin. His, his, his death does do that. But it doesn't just wipe our slate clean and then tell us to try harder and to do better with this new fresh start that we have. If he did that, we would still fall short. It's like, okay, everything's been cleared from here on out. The very next five seconds, I've got dirt on my slate again. He does not just clear away the sin. He does not just wipe our cl slate clean and give us a fresh start. The perfect, obedient life of Christ is reckoned as ours. His righteous, obedient life, the righteousness that He, that he did the, in, in our place is counted as ours. He wipes our slate clean and puts Christ's righteousness on it. <laughs> he could not do that if He had uh, sub-righteousness, if He didn't have perfect obedience. But the perfect life of Christ is ours. We are made, in fact, Scripture says, we are made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Romans 5, 19 tells us, For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so then by the one man's obedience the many will be made sinners. Righteous. So in Christ, you and I are righteous. Not because of ourselves, not because of our righteous deeds. We're not, Jesus didn't get us just so far and now we're taking it from there. No. Jesus wiped our slate clean and gave us his righteous life. So when God looks at us, he sees Christ's righteousness. He doesn't see my good deeds. He doesn't see my bad deeds. <laughs> he doesn't see me at all. He sees Christ. That, that's our salvation. That, that is what, we, we, what should give us hope for, for the future, which should give us peace in the midst of, of, our, of our sinfulness and, and should just, it just blow our mind, the, the amount of grace and mercy that He has shown towards us. He doesn't see me. He sees Christ. So then, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. His active obedience, his righteous life is necessary for our salvation. Can't just clear guilt. We have to be made righteous. Man, there's so much there. And number seven, the death of Christ. Verse eight, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He lived a perfect, sinless life. His active obedience was perfect. He did everything he needed to do. But we also see his passive obedience here. Now, passive is not meaning he was <laughs> passive and like, I don't care. Uh, no. Passive means he took on the sufferings necessary to pay the penalty for our sin. Active obedience, he actively obeyed God. He actively lived his life in order to do all things according to God's will. Passive, he suffered. He took on suffering. All the suffering necessary to pay for the penalty of our sin. Now we're not just, so here we go, we're not just talking about the cross. In his living, all that he had suffered was also in our place 
Again, he sympathizes with our weaknesses because he went through the same human process as we do. He suffered in his life and, on, and in the pain on the way to the cross. He suffered body and soul. Think, think of a few uh, uh, examples here. He was tempted in the wilderness in, in Matthew chapter 4. He was hungry. He was tempted by the devil to, to, to forsake God's word and to put uh, instead faith in him. We uh, might not think about this, but he suffered by growing. Anybody else suffer in growing? Growing to maturity. That's, a, that's not a fun process. Does anybody else enjoy that process? It's suffering to be human. God never would have had to experience that until he took on flesh, till he took on uh, human form. So even in his growing up, he suffered. Um, Hebrews 5.8 tells us that he learned obedience through what he suffered. He, as I mentioned earlier, he experienced loss and grief and, and all these other things that that it is to be human. And then, at the point of death, right before his death, the excruciating physical suffering of the cross, of the, of the crucifixion process. He was whipped. He was beaten. He was mocked. There were thorns shoved into his head. He had nails that were nailed into his arms or his, his hands and his feet. These are all examples of his suffering in life to the point of or on the way to death. All of that, all of that was his obedience. All of that was his passive obedience. He had to suffer. And then, of course, the suffering on the cross. Yes, there was physical suffering. And that, that can't be discounted. But there was more suffering that happened on the cross than just physical pain. The kind of pain we can't even imagine. Jesus Christ, the sinless human, took your sins and mine, became sin. 1 Peter 2, 4. He, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. God imputed our sins onto the sinless Son. He took our sin. Jesus took our sin upon Himself. Sin He did not commit. And the Father, God the Father, reckoned those sins as Christ's very own and then poured out His wrath for all of those sins on Christ. What is the payment for sin? death, but it's eternal death. He paid eternal death on the cross for you and me. Can you imagine that? I don't want to imagine that. Christ took our sins and therefore the wrath of God on Himself. And in that, Christ became what the scriptures call, tell us, our propitiation for sin. It's a, a propitiation means a, a sacrifice that turns away the wrath of God and thereby makes God propitious or favorable towards us. God, Jesus bore the wrath of God so that we don't have to bear the wrath of God. Jesus, God's Son, God the Father, in His plan, all of this took place in order for us to be saved from God. God is not saving us from Satan. God is not saving us from ourself. God is not saving us from, from evil. God is saving us from Himself. Our sin deserves eternal wrath and punishment in hell. And God's the one that will pour that out. 
In order to save us, He made atonement for us in order to save us from Himself. From Himself, for Himself, and all by Himself. Amen. That's what Christ suffered on the cross. This is what Christ suffered on our behalf. Christ suffered death, even death on a cross for us. I want us to notice something here. Then suffering is part of obedience. It's not something odd or weird to a Christian. It's a regular part of Christian life. Suffering. It's part of being obedient to God. And we can suffer well. We can do it because we have the Spirit of God in us now. And we can suffer well even if it's to the point of death. Look, <laughs> Christ is our example of this. He is the suffering servant. Life and in death, He suffered. We can look to Christ. We can look to the Word of God. Go, for example, go read 1 Peter. I, I, if you're suffering and you don't understand suffering, go read 1 Peter. What an example for us of an incredible study of Christian suffering. Look to the example of other believers through Christian history. Look at all the martyrs. Listen, we, we, we don't grasp this concept because we live in America in 2022. We think of suffering as something that needs to be put off. Suffering is a part of the Christian life. Until recent history, it was, it was a very real part of Christian life. So many who have been martyred in the history of Christianity. Obedience to the point of suffering and even to the point of death is normal. For a Christian. So what do these three points have to do with the overall purpose of this passage? Paul is making a point here by utilizing these theological truths concerning Christ. And they're, again, they're so deep, we, we can't really plumb the depths of all of those in a few sermons working our way through these verses. The obedient life and death of the incarnate Christ is our salvation. There is no doubt about that. Without the active obedience of Christ in our place and without the, the, the active, their passive obedience of Christ's death in our place, we, we have no salvation. But that's not Paul's purpose here in this context. It's a reminder He's reminding us of the gospel. He's reminding us of these essential truths. But he's making an overall contextual point. Paul uses this reminder of the gospel, of who Christ is and what he has done as a motivating factor for our own humility. If Christ has done all of this for us, how? How can you expect your own way? How, how can you expect others to serve you and not serve others? How, how can you pridefully and arrogantly set yourself above other people? That, that's Paul's purpose here. Remember, that's the context that we're talking about. It, 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 it's a motivating factor for our own humility. We must, yes, believe it. Yes, we must put our faith in Christ and receive salvation. That is, that is the primary understanding of the gospel and, and of who Christ is. Yes. But for the Christian, it is our example. You, are, you already have, have salvation. Now you need to know you've got to be like Jesus. Do you forget what Jesus did for you? Do you forget what, 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 faith you have, uh, what, what your faith is in? Have you forgotten? Paul is using this as an example to us. Jesus is the ultimate example of humility. God became man, emptied himself of, his, of all of his privileges of God, and he became obedient to the point of death on a cross. 
the ultimate example of humility. And so Paul is setting up Christ as our example that we should do these things, that we should pursue humility, that we should pursue unity because of who Jesus is and because of what Jesus has done. Thomas Watson, old Puritan guy, said this, Let this be our chief aim in duty, that we may grow more in love with God and be made more like Him. 